before I go on with that, I just want to let you know about um, probably the best text on electromagnetic sensitivity on the market, which came out recently by Michael Bevington, it's just been updated this year. Uh, goes through 1,828 scientific studies and its impact on pathology uh, from melatonin to oxidative stress heat shock proteins. It looks at what Russia is doing, Sweden, Austria, etc. It's a remarkable textbook, well worth getting. Um, I got it through the ESUK mob. Um, yeah, so well worth looking at. I'll pass it around, you can have a flick through. It's a, quite a great book. Definition of individual EMF sensitivity is a difficult problem because individuals' reactions to electromagnetic fields are polyparametrical. It depends on the frequency, the intensity, the localization, and the exposition. Um, Oleg Grigoryov is the president of the Russian National Committee on Non-Ionizing Radiation. He is the equivalent to our Panzer, except he is proactive for the public about reducing exposure. Hours ago, no, there's no problem. The diagnostic protocol. There are three diagnostic protocols that are being used for electromagnetic field um, diagnoses. First, by Tangler, electromagnetic hypersensitivity and the precautionary principle. The Austrian Medical Association 2012 admitted guidelines for its GPs for diagnosis, and I'll go into that. And uh, Grigori of the Russian Health and EMF Exposure Protocol. So I'll go into a little bit of all of them. And, um, <coughs> The Austrian Medical Association publishes guidelines to the GPs <coughs> as a duty of care. This is something I remember when I did a great deep in health and safety, duty of care. I think we've lost the understanding of what a duty of care means. But anyway, Austrian Medical Association as a duty of care have provided guidelines to be able to diagnose patients with these conditions. Patient questionnaire, ask enough questions. Very, very important. Mobile phone use. You know, when I was lecturing to naturopaths, I lectured at uni for about 12 years in acupuncture and naturopathy. And I was always amazed at the end of the talk, I'd have women nurses come up to me who worked in oncology wards and would say, you know, I'm working in the oncology ward and brain surgeons don't ask, and neurosurgeons aren't asking if they're using a mobile phone. You know, this was of course in the 90s when I was teaching most of my teaching. They're not seeing a connection and their response is, we're not here to get to the cause, we're here to, to treat the symptom and treat the disease. The researchers need to get to the cause. But how can the researchers get to the cause if they're not getting the funding? If they do get the funding, and then it's poor because it's not in line with the person who's giving the funding. I mean, the system is ridiculous. Cardiovascular, look, cardiovascular and laboratory tests, I will go through these. Um, and then assess the electromagnetic field, mould and radon <coughs> exposure. Has everyone heard of radon? Radon, of course, is the second most common cause of lung cancer in the world. It is due to living above uranium deposits or phosphate rock, which have high uranium levels and that breaks down into different daughter products eventually into radon gas. In America, it's a problem because they have basements and accumulates into the basement and into the, into the house itself. It's such an issue in the States that you have to have a real estate transaction before you sell your house in areas where they have high radon levels. If the levels are above the US exposure limit, you're not allowed to sell your house, which means there's a good chance you'll probably die of lung-related cancers. There are, our PANS recently have actually put a radon map on its website, and it's well worth looking at. Before I go and do an audit in a remote area, I'll always check for thorium, potassium, and uranium deposits, because you can find there are actually hot spots throughout Victoria, New South Wales, WA and, and, and uh, Northern Territory, etc. Uh, you know, that's why they're mining for these radioactive nucleotides. There are actually maps that you can see which areas are high levels of exposure. It's on Arkansas' website. <coughs> Just go radon map. Radon map of Australia. What were the other ones you're looking for? Radon, potassium? Any of the radionucleotides. Thorium is a big problem because Australia has the highest rates of thorium deposits in the world. I think we export it to India for their nuclear program. Uh, but it's called a radiometric map and a radon map of Australia. Uh, our PANSA have actually looked at most, I think they've got a plane with a Geiger counter to actually go around most of Australia to, to determine what levels of radioactive material are coming out of various parts of Australia. And this is important because if you're a, a rural GP, you could be in an area that is higher levels of radon, which could have higher levels of lung cancer, not related to smoking. Um, so th I think these are an important part of our investigative work as practitioners. 
Cardiovascular, so this is what the Austrian Medical Association will assess. Blood pressure, absence of nighttime decline. The blood pressure continues on throughout the night, especially when they're exposed to electromagnetic fields. The ECG, the heart rhythm diagnosis and arterial pressure. Heart rate variability is a big one as a result of autonomic nervous system diagnosis. Basic lab tests include early morning urine for melatonin, adrenaline or adrenaline, dopamine and serotonin, cortisol levels at various times of the day, blood FBE, full blood examination, fasting blood glucose, etc. As I said, I'm not a GP, I don't do these tests, so if you want more information on it, there's actually, go to the Austrian protocol. I've actually downloaded here, guideline of the Austrian Medical Association, and it includes a questionnaire that they give to the clients on EHS diagnosis. So I'll pass that around and uh, it'll give you a good idea. You just got that downloaded off the yeah, just download, guideline for the Austrian Medical Association. Yep. Additional tests, late morning urine for histamine, GABA, glutamate, etc. <coughs> You've got it in your notes. Neurological tests, cerebral perfusion, left limbic reduction in blood flow, uh, on an EEG, the characteristic of an alpha range in parietal occipital areas, brain glucose levels are reduced, and spec scanning. I don't even need to know if these are available here. But According to Tungler and von Klitzing, who actually have a diagnostic criteria for EHS, they've suggested, again, heart rate variability, frequency analysis of the right waves is abnormal, capillary blood flow to measure capacity of the autonomic nervous system. In EHS, this regulation shows no activity for some time after electromagnetic field exposure. Electric skin potential difference on the forearm. So here you can see yellow line being the ECG in an EH sufferer versus a healthy subject. The red line being the electric skin potential significantly different. And the microcirculation, of course, is quite different. Um, and these is the markers they're using to assess for electromagnetic field exposure. Inflammatory markers. Dietrich Klinghart, I have to say, is an MD who follows a lot of Richard Shoemaker's work, which I talked about this morning. And he has looked at TGFB1, um, an increase in the inflammation in people exposed to electromagnetic fields, as well as MMP9, uh, metallomethoxyproteinase 9, which is an inflammatory marker, and an increase in copper. Tests, the British Society of Ecological Medicine have their own diagnostic protocol for EHS, from stool, urine and hair analysis for metals and pesticides, Live blood analysis, a lot of useful, interesting videos on the internet about how um, exposure to radio frequencies can cause relay formations in people exposed to um, wireless technology. Lymphocyte sensitivity test is used by the Breakspear Medical Group in the UK to determine reactions of cells to chemicals. And there's some information on their testing, which is quite a, an interesting non-invasive test that they use for, for patients for chemical sensitivities as well basophil activation test and autonomic nervous system test. Recognition of electromagnetic hypersensitivity would ensure full compliance with the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities of um, 2007. So this is where I feel our country does not comply with this and maybe we should argue this in a Supreme Court if anyone had the funds to do this. So which organisations are concerned about electromagnetic fields. And when I started looking at this, I was quite shocked. We are talking about there are tens of thousands of doctors who have signed petitions in Europe against the use of wireless technology in schools. The Council of Europe, who are part of the European Union, the International Commission for Electromagnetic Safety, the Russian National Committee on Non-Ionising Radiation, that's their regulatory authority. Well, don't see our pans are on that, surprise the International Commission for Electromagnetic Safety, the German Federal Government, the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and all of these resolutions and drafts and appeals that have occurred. Just to give you an idea, the Sellerton Statement has thousands of signatures from doctors. <coughs> thousands. So each of these resolutions and appeals by med medical professionals and scientists throughout the world who have indicated their concern about the use of Wi-Fi, and particularly in children. 
So this is not new. This isn't a new topic. This has been going on for quite some time. So what I want to do now is to show you where those sources are in our environment, outside and inside, and then show you very, very simply how we can reduce our exposure and what to tell your patients. Because unfortunately, the more this information gets out there, the more people freak out and buy stuff that gives them a false sense of security and doesn't do a damn thing to reducing their exposure, and that is frightening. So the external sources of electromagnetic fields include your mobile phone towers. Now, it's impossible to know just from distance alone what your level of exposure will be for several reasons. Firstly, it depends on how many mobile phone users are using that tower at any given time. So with this couple in Northcote who had many ears disease, both of them, who had these five mobile phone towers in visible sight from their bedroom, the concern I had is I said, this is the readings I'm getting now during the day. Because you live in an area where there are a lot of nightclubs, more people are going to be using their mobile phones than potentially what I'm picking up during the day. So whatever reading I'm getting could be worse at night time. Because, of course, the level of radiation can vary depending on the number of users. Now, because of we have buildings, we have trees, we have uh, built environments, and because of this, Unless it's direct line of sight, it's impossible to know what level you're going to be exposed to because radio frequencies get reflected off certain surfaces and refracted off others, and they go through others. They will go through windows, but they will be reflected off the aluminium frame of the window. They will bounce off most of the vapour barriers in new homes. So new homes, that, that blue water vapour barrier, can reflect a lot of external forms of electromagnetic fields. The metal roof, if the mobile phone tower radiation is coming at the roof, it will reflect it, fantastic. But if they bring in wireless technology into that house, what's going to happen? It's just going to bounce in, isn't it? Because you're keeping it in at the same time. So we have to think about the consequences of what we're doing and what we're bringing in. Because without a meter, it is impossible with radio frequencies to know what you're exposed to. With extra low frequency magnetic fields from our appliances, we use a different device compared to what we use with a radio frequency. Because uh, magnetic fields, the electric and, and magnetic field combine at the 50 hertz frequency, we use one meter for that. This is, for, this is a Gauss meter and it measures magnetic fields. I use this to check anything that draws current, which I've mentioned, the meter box, the fridge, the oven. So for children particularly, I want to make sure when I'm doing their house that wherever their bed head is, because remember the bedroom is the most critical part because of its impact of melatonin, you go to where the bed is, you switch everything on, including what's on the other side of the wall, and then you take the magnetic field readings. And you don't want anything above what? What was the level that caused childhood leukaemia? Four. So the levels in a bedroom, the building biology standard is no more than 0.2 per bedroom, 0.2. So what I find is I go in there, I take a measurement, I go, okay, it's 53 milligauss. Why? Because mum's cooking at the moment and the oven's on the other side of the wall drawing a hell of a lot of current. The oven will draw more current than any other device. So if it's an adult near the oven, not a problem, because are you going to be cooking and sleeping at the same time? Not likely unless you're a shift worker. So you have to think about those scenarios, unless you're very, very handy. <laughs> So that can be an issue. Sometimes here you'll have a fridge. There's a client, here's a, a, a cot, and there's a fridge. I'll check it, it's fine. But when I open the door of the fridge and wait till it gets hot and then the motor kicks in and it starts to cool, that's when the magnetic field comes halfway through the room of that child's room. And because the fridge is going on and off all night, that's a big no. So the first thing I always check that is the most important thing for you to ask your patients is, what's on the other side of the wall of the bed? Make sure there are no electronic devices there and certainly no smart meters or meter boxes. Then inside that bedroom, digital clocks, keep it two meters away so that the magnetic field will drop within two meters. Put it on the other side of the wall of your bed instead. Anything, your mobile phones. You know, the amount of teenagers who are using this as an alarm clock you know, it's interesting, when you look at it, it tells me what suburb I'm in. Why? Because it's tuning into the nearest cell tower every 30 seconds. You don't want that near your head and sleeping below your pillow. And yet this is a common phenomenon with many of the young people who for some reason can't be without Facebook for two hours. <laughs> 
So this is an issue. This should not be charged. The charge itself will emit a high field, which will drop off after about 30 centimetres. But this, the radio frequencies are constantly tuning into the cell tower, so this is a problem in the bedroom. It should be in a kitchen or living space, well away from where people sleep. If you do nothing else, the most important thing you do is to make sure people sleep, because without adequate melatonin levels and the ability to recover, everything else will fall apart in their illness. Radio TV towels, WiMAX, Adelaide, Recently on that Today Tonight interview, it all started with Adelaide, who were very proud because they've got the first WiMAX across the entire city. The entire city of Adelaide is now bathed in wireless technology, whether you like it or not. So um, that was quite ironic, uh, commenting about that. The neighbour's smart meter. Our gas meters are going to be smart. Now, it's interesting they've used the term smart because there's nothing smart about them. You know, the amount of fires that have occurred, as I mentioned, the adverse health effects that, that we're suspecting are happening now is certainly an issue. <coughs> a big one, though, is security. The frequencies that are using for smart meters are this, uh, a frequency that any hacker can hack into. And recently, there was a case in England where a mother heard a voice in her child's bedroom, the child was two, in a cot, and she could hear a man talking through the wireless baby monitor to the child because you can hack into this freak. This is a, a free frequency. You know how Telstra buys different frequencies, etc. that only they can own? The wireless technology frequency that we use is an open frequency, so anyone can use it. So hackers could actually get in to your frequency and through your wireless um, connections, get into your computer and hack it wirelessly, which is another reason why wireless technology and wireless computers shouldn't be used for data storage, etc because people, hackers can get into it. And this was an interesting case. You know, walking up in the middle of the night, you can hear a man's voice in a child's bedroom, and he was talking through the wireless baby monitor because he could hack into that frequency. So these are the things that people aren't thinking about before they introduce this technology into the general population. The other sources of wireless routers, this is a big one. Wireless router, ask your patients, where is the wireless router? Because it will be set to the highest setting. So it will go through your home, potentially half your neighbour's home, into your garden, etc. If you continue to use a wireless router, I strongly suggest you get to the manufacturer's instructions and dampen it down to the lowest setting. So it's only emitted in your office, not the whole house and not the neighbourhood. You can do that. Power it down. The other thing is, as I mentioned, only have it on when you use it, when you need the internet connectivity. Don't have it on all the time. It's emitting radio frequency, digital pulse radio frequencies 24 hours a day. And if I have my meter there to measure it, I'll check it from upstairs. I can point to where your wireless router is and I'll know exactly where it is through the floor because it'll be coming up through your floor, down the floor. So if you live in a multi-storey building, you can see why building biologists don't live in multi-storey buildings because it's becoming impossible to be able to control our environment because of the people next to us. Internal sources are, again, smart meters. Ask where it is. My journey started from a meter box from 10 miscarriages. Wireless routers, cordless phones. Interesting thing about the cordless phones is that the adverse health effects are more than double in the incidence of gliomas with cordless phones than they are with mobile phones. So a cordless phone had more, if it's used on one side of the head for a minimum of 30 minutes a day for 10 years, it had 470% increase in gliomas, as opposed to a mobile phone used on one side of the head for at least 30 minutes a day for 10 years had a 220% increase in gliomas. People don't think of that as a wireless technology, do they? But that's wireless, isn't it? And this emits constant radio frequencies throughout the whole house because it has to connect to the other cradle, you know, in the garden when you're walking out and having a conversation. That's a problem. So it's really important that we start thinking about getting rid of these devices and using corded phones, hardwired corded phones. I know they're inconvenient. Maybe the conversation with the teenager might be a bit less because she can't move around now, etc. Um, really go back to basics. Until they can prove conclusively that this technology is safe, we need to implement the precautionary principle, which is to go back to hardwired connections. I'll talk about how to use your mobile phone safely too, because it's an important part of my business. 
Wireless printers. Gee, I've had some amazing, you know, tens of thousands of microwatts per meter squared from a wireless printer. It can be very high. So turn the wireless function off. External sources of uh, AC magnetic fields. As I said, this is a different type of field from high voltage transmission lines, etc. The interesting thing about the synergistic effect is that when you have an AC magnetic field and you combine it with ultrafine particles and particulates, you create charged particles. And I think this is the interesting thing that Ray um, was looking at also, is if we combine electromagnetic fields and charging ultrafine particles, which they're not even assessing when we don't have an exposure standard, and we breathe those in, the ramifications are quite daunting. In fact, there have been limited studies of asthma rates and lung-related problems with people living near high-voltage transmission lines because if they are near major arterial routes, those car exhausts, you know, of course, distribute it with the wind distribution, but then they get attracted to these the electric field around the line, which charges the particles, which when you inhale can have significant deterioration and inflammatory responses in um, the body. And this is the thing. With exposure standards, we don't look at synergy. That is the problem. We look at one chemical on one rat and the LD50. We don't look at the synergistic effect of everything we're exposed to, let alone the impact of electromagnetic fields on the blood-brain barrier and what it does to the chemicals and heavy metals. I know it's pretty... I'm actually going to get good on this and, and you know, I'll give you some tips on how to do this. But I've just... Just freaked this out. I, I, I just impressed. bought a Wi-Fi extender last week. <laughs> no! Don't do that! No, 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 don't do that. Bad news. <laughs> this talk is going to get better. But until you realise the extent of what is happening and the amount of people, especially kids with headaches, etc., that's often the first sign. And insomnia, sleep disturbances are one of the big things we check as building biologists because it's often happening as a result of something in their house. Electric blankets. The Swedes indicate to all pregnant women never use an electric blanket. Why? Because as long as it's plugged in at the wall, it's creating high electric fields. So when you're sleeping on sleeping, sleeping on an electric blanket, even though it's not heating, as long as it's turned on at the wall, it's got voltage, which creates high electric field, which means your body voltage increases. So the body voltage increases. And because of this, the Swedes said, mm, we recommend no pregnant women on electric, on, uh, electric blankets. Pla if you need an electric blanket, I'd say, look, either get flannel sheets or a hot partner would be a much better option. <laughs> or if that's not an option, with your electric blanket, unplug it before you go in so there's no electrical magnetic field. I've mentioned the oven, the fridge, the digital clock, inverters. This is another green movement gone wrong. <laughs> Photovoltaics, good idea, mm, as long as the inverter is not on the house. The inverter that converts from DC to AC emits very high magnetic fields. So you want to keep that well away from a living area or from a bedroom because it is a real problem for sleep again. So just to summarise, lights, CFLs. Don't start me on CFLs. Another green idea gone wrong. You know, loaded with mercury vapour. The energy, which we those? The compact fluorescent light bulbs, yeah. Curly ones, basically. A real problem. For people with electrical sensitivity, they emit UV radiation. They're not very good anyway, are they? No. As in what? They emit radio frequencies. They emit magnetic fields. They emit almost all of the worst types of EMFs that we find in the built environment. Most people who are electrically sensitive will not tolerate CFLs at all and think they're going mad because when they change the bulbs, all of a sudden they're better. When I was looking at the research in my book for healthy lighting, there's very few studies on healthy lighting because the best is, of course, the sun, which is what we want to emulate. Um, CFLs was the worst. And in fact, the best was the incandescent light bulb, which you can't get. So what's the next best? Well, sunlight, look, the only other options you have is LEDs. They're not great, but they don't have all the issues with CFLs. Are there different kinds of LEDs? Okay, so what did the Austrian Medical Association say? Reduce exposure to artificial EMFs in the home and workplace. Start unplugging things. Do you really need half the stuff you think you need? Do we need? You know, I remember coming into one house where she had infertility. She had every appliance, or he had every appliance in that bedroom you could possibly have. I don't know why, two, why you need two TVs in the house, in the bedroom. You know, two cordless phones, two mobile phone chargers, two TVs, a meter box on the other side of the wall of her bed. She'd been to ten naturopaths, four doctors. She was infertile. She said, "I don't get it. I had kids." 
when I, I had an abortion when I was young. I know I can get pregnant, but since you know I've moved here, etc., I can't have children. She, there was more radiation going on in that room. It could have lit up, you know, a fluorescent light bulb. It was a real problem, and no one thought to ask about her house and the amount of equipment in this bedroom. I mean, my meds went off before I was just getting into the doorway. Anti-oxidative and anti-nitrosidative therapies, a lifestyle coaching, treat symptoms, of course. Um, this is their Ada H for treating EHS sufferers. Avoid man-made EMS. Of course, again, get to the cause. Get them to look at alternatives to electromagnetic fields and technology. Use hardwired uh, cable connections. Breathe fresh air, negative ions. Get out in the bush, providing there's no farm or crop dusting, of course. <laughs> Cognitive behavioural therapy, dental care, mercury is a big one. I've not come across any patient with CFS who didn't get worse as a result of mercury removal. I think because maybe we could get better dentists to do it properly, potentially. I know we've got some great dentists here who will do that. Um, with the rubber dams and the oxygen and the charcoal tablets and so important. Otherwise, these patients take a year back in regressive therapy because of the mercury exposure. Uh, friendly foods, of course, we all know that. Grounding, bathing, bare feet. Get out to nature, find out. You know, sometimes I think a lot of the illnesses we have is because we've lost our sense of place in the world. We have no connection to the earth anymore. So getting out to, you know, the bush and getting out to the, to the beach, etc., and grounding is important. Hydration, of course, providing it's not chlorinated and it's not fluoridated, but don't start going that because that's another topic. <laughs> Sunlight, sleep, critical. Very, very important. And saunas. Very useful. A lot of people with these illnesses find sauna therapy. The sauna can emit a high magnetic field. So what you do <laughs> is that you put the sauna on, get it hot, turn it off, then go in. Okay, that's the trick. Not to be exposed to high magnetic fields because they do work. So are you allowed to electric blanket like that as well? Yes, you turn it, it and then you switch it off on the wall? Tw switch it off or unplug it, yes. Exactly. <laughs> To maximise sleep, no appliances. Check the bed head on the other side of the wall of the bed head. Check the floor. If you're in a multi-storey apartment, the transformers in the fluorescent light bulbs below create hot spots. So when I'm doing an audit, I'll find with kids, if they're sleeping in bedrooms upstairs, I'll ask where do children play? And wherever they play, I'm on the floor checking because all of a sudden I've got a high magnetic field because of the lighting from the floor below. So let's put a wardrobe on top of that so the child can't sleep there and we force them to have to play over here. That's a simple solution, it doesn't cost anything. Bedding and clothing, natural fibres, timber bed, metal conducts electricity, so timber's better. Uh, avoid noise, light, vibration. Um, vibration for people living above train lines and things can be all sorts of issues there as well. No stimulants, two hours before bed, supplemental melatonin can be useful. Distance, distance, distance. So this is what I recommend with all my clients. Because what we do is when we're in the home, we're teaching them how to create a healthy home. Distance, this is the physics of radiation. As you double the distance away from the source, you reduce your exposure by 75%. So if the meter box is on that wall, you move to another room or to the opposite wall, at least a meter and a half, two meters away to reduce your exposure. Get the digital clock radio and either throw it out or put it on the opposite side of the wall or get a wind-up clock or a battery clock instead. Check the bed head behind the wall. Avoid wireless devices, especially near living spaces where people spend time and bedroom spaces is critical. iPads, iPhones, if they're mm -hmm. given to children, they need to be put on flight mode. So the flight mode will help to, to stop that connect that radio frequencies and trying to tune in, etc. So flight mode is really important. Once they've downloaded the app onto their iPads, put it in flight mode to reduce their exposure. They are now fitting toys with radio frequency transmitters and giving them to babies. There are toys that with radio frequencies um, that are now being marketed in the US and no doubt in Australia soon. This is something that shouldn't be on. Use cables and hardwired connections instead. Of course, cable 80. So you can still have your technology, just use hardwired. I noticed here it was hardwired, which was good. Wiring a home. At the design stage, there's so much we can prevent with electromagnetic fields. Um, but unfortunately, not a lot of this is thought about. Shielded cabling can be useful, metal conduit can be great. Think about, don't have power points on your bed head side. So when you wire the house, put the bed head where there are no power points and appliances on the other side of the wall. Make sure the bedrooms don't butt up against a kitchen where there's the oven, where there is a fridge. 
because that can create high fields going on and off all the time. Windows, awning, so often people um, will go out and do audits and what we can find is we can reduce radio frequencies from mobile phone towers by having metal blinds. So the metal blind will reflect, so at night time if you close the blinds it will reflect at least 70-80% of the radio frequencies from the mobile phone tower. So these are very simple ways we can reduce our exposure. A demand switch can be great for people with electrical sensitivity and basically that involves getting an electrician involved and putting circuits, the demand switch into the meter box to shut down the electric and magnetic field and the radio frequencies. Multi-storey buildings, don't know what to say about that except that we're all moving out to the rural areas now. Very difficult. Unless you shielded paint, you shielded paint all over your um, apartment, it's very difficult to stop the radiation coming from your neighbours. And if you did that, then you create a metal Faraday cage and then you're not connected to the Earth's magnetic field, which is what we've evolved on for millennia. What ramifications does that have? I don't know. We have natural forms of radiation, the Schumann resonance, and we have the Earth's magnetic field, which we have evolved on. So it's these things we want to keep this, this, the natural radiation, the sun and light as much as possible and reduce the man-made radiation as much as possible. Shielding, please don't get conned or get your patients to get someone in who tests for EMS and shields because they're going to make you or them spend thousands of dollars in shielding they don't need. That is a massive conflict of interest and it's a big problem in my industry. People who have jumped on the bandwagon who don't know what they're doing, who are using equipment that's irrelevant, it's not effective and it's not accurate. And then getting clients to spend thousands of dollars of shielding. Unless the device creates a distance between you and the source, it's unlikely to give you any benefit except a false sense of security. So the issue with your mobile phone is always distance. Keep it away from a vital organ, like your reproductive organs, your heart, and particularly your brain. So this is how you would use your mobile phone with the earpiece. It simply reduces the exposure levels by 99%. So it's just a matter of doing this and then either talking like that, obviously the radiation is in the phone, that would be even better. Uh, to talk to the phone like that and you have to talk a bit loud and of course it's going to be noisy. There are disadvantages but look, what's the cost of your health? What about those um, cell safe um, uh, things that you have now that you can put behind the phone because I've got one and I'm just thinking uh, there was a lot of stuff on, on showing that they reduce up to 95 percent. Yeah, we're on video. <laughs> The way that works is, look, you've got things like these pouches. This is shielding material. Right? It's shielded by the side. If I put that in there, I will now no longer be able to make or receive calls. So I know that works. So I'm carried on me, but I can't get calls. I can't make calls and I can't receive calls. When I get it out, it's going to go big, big, big. You've got messages that you didn't get before. This is excellent, especially for men who carry it near the reproductive organs. That's a problem. However, with the cell safe or not mentioning brands, it's based on you put it here and you still have it next to your head, don't you? I don't, but yeah. Okay. Right. The way people use it, they get the card and they go, okay, what it's doing is diverting the radiation from the antenna here to down there. Whether it's there or there is irrelevant to me, it's still going right around. And you're still putting it near your head. The physics of radiation is simple. Unless you create distance from the antenna to you, it's not going to reduce the levels. The cell safe one is based on the SAR test, specific absorption rate, and they are, those tests are considered invalid by most of the progressive scientists who are researching the impact of electromagnetic fields. You will delete that, thank you so much. <laughs> Obviously I'm not sponsored by that. stuff now. <laughs> Use a corner phone where you can, distance, text. Just text instead of calling, loudspeaker as much as possible, and using good reception, big one. When you, you look at your mobile phone, the more bars there are, the easier the connection, so the less radiation. The less bars there are, the harder it has to work at getting a signal and the higher the level of radiation. That's why farmers are often showing high rates of gliomas and brain tumours, because they have poorer reception in remote areas than the city folk. So more pesticides. Right, I just want to finish this. So this is what I do, building biologists, blah, blah, blah. That's me. Um, write a book, Healthy Home, Healthy Family. Lots of good tips on how to reduce your exposure. And I run the College of Environmental Studies. And that's references. Thank you so much. Right, we have a few minutes for questions. And just by the way, I had my own bedroom checked in our old house. There was masses of stuff going on. 
and I have an isolator switch, which I switch last thing at night, and it cuts the whole part of the house off. Right. Uh, versus a demand switch. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. Very scary. <laughs> I have a question about melatonin, and I'm not sure whether you can answer the question, but do you think it is beneficial to give a child who lives in a house where, for example, in a multi-story house, just to give them, if they have sleep problems, half a milligram or one milligram a night of melatonin, or do you think that they that can have long-term side effects of maybe reducing the innate or the... the Yes, production. I can't comment on that because I don't prescribe and I'm not working as a practitioner anymore. Um, my main focus will be making sure what is affecting the melatonin in the first place and eliminating those sources. Then I leave it up to you guys to decide whether to use that or not. Yep. I can't. I'm just wondering whether even as a protective, if you cannot eliminate everything, it would be protective to just give children a bit of melatonin. And we use it in pediatrics all the time. Yes. And well, I think protective the antioxidant and anti Wi Fi measure. Yeah, I think the most important thing for any person, whether it's a child or an adult, is to enhance their vitality and to diagnose holistically what's going on, affect, you know, improve their gut dysbiosis, look at their mineral status, look at their heavy metals, address all of that and treat the patient and address all of those issues. And if they're healthier because of that, they're going to be able to adapt a lot more quickly to external sources of environmental hazards. Thank you. Thank you. Um, what was your advice about going to charge cell phones overnight? Was it two meters away from the bed or somewhere else? Yeah, so the actual transformer, which is just the charging, you want to keep it about a meter away from the head. The problem is the charger, is that's one issue, and a meter away, no problem. The problem is with this is that it's tuning into the nearest cell tower. So it's emitting radiation through the whole room. Um, and that's why it's important to put this into a kitchen <coughs> away from your bedroom. So the, the charge of the radiation, well, the fields don't go that far. But <coughs> this one, yes. Travel, that's travel through the whole region. Radio frequencies. Okay. That's right. Yeah, so the, the transformer emits magnetic fields, this emits radio frequencies. Even if okay. it's turned off? Even if it's turned off, unless it's in flight mode. So in flight mode, it won't be doing that emitting, which means you don't get any internet connectivity and you can't make or receive call. Yeah, but in flight mode, no problem. However, when it's in flight mode and used as an alarm, when the alarm goes off, it emits very high magnetic fields for very short periods of time. So you don't want it on your pillow when it's doing that. But it's aggressive now, too. No, it's unlikely because it's not continuous throughout the night. I was thinking, um, Ian, I'm a rural GP, so having a phone accessible at all is critical. To, at night time, are there things like docking stations where you can go and drop your phone in and it reroutes back to your normal wide phone uh, at night time, so you can leave your phone in the kitchen, for instance? I don't know. Uh, there is a type of um, cordless phone, which you can get from Germany, um, which doesn't admit until there's a phone call coming in. The same as phone, yeah. What is it? So it's it's one of the same. Oh, what about the um, Bluetooth in your car? Yes. Because it's got a metal frame. Yes. Exactly. And we all use it. Yep. There we go. There we go. <laughs> I'm not important enough for me to answer a phone while I'm driving. Sorry? I'm not important enough for me to answer a phone while I'm driving. <laughs> well, most of us yeah. <laughs> I mean, obviously, well, obviously that's... Oh, uh, okay. No, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. So the Bluetooth is an issue only while you're actually making a call. Okay. Yeah. But the Bluetooth tends to, as I said, has a lower, the strength of the field is a lot lower, but it's still well above the buy initiative report recommendations and the building biology recommendations. It's still wireless. <coughs> and your head is going to be different to a child's head in terms of that, but it's still, there's so much evidence to indicate that this radiation is harmful, that we need to implement the precautionary principle where we can. But this is a problem, it's like asbestos. Asbestos was in 3,000 building materials. It was a brilliant building material, mm -hmm. but it came at the cost of serious mm -hmm. health costs. Mm -hmm. So we need to look at this and start, because kids are becoming addicted. There's a psychology mm -hmm. component to this as well, which can have devastating impacts, I suspect, down the track that we need to address as well. You know, kids need to get out in the dirt, as far as I'm concerned, away from technology. But uh, we need to start addressing this and having a voice 
to start challenging the exposure stance because every time I get called about another childcare centre that they're going to put a mobile phone tower within 100 metres and I'll say in court it's, they're going to accept it because it's within the expo a PANS's exposure standards which are not adequate and no one's talking about the inadequacies of the, of the standards. One of the symptoms you mentioned was sympathetic stimulus and blood pressure not dropping. So if you have a patient who's got total um, autonomic dysregulation and they're a bloody mess, could that be this? You need to ask, this is asking questions. Tell me what's in your bedroom. What are the appliances? How close are they to your head? What's on the other side of your bed? How long have you had the illness? How long have you lived in this house? Could there be, this is when I started to notice this connection with many of my patients with mould, is I'd say, you know, how, isn't that interesting? But wait a minute, you said this began 18 months ago and you moved into your house then. Let's start talking about the house. I think because, you know, as a naturopath, when we're trained in this field, not that people are environmental health, and we don't do house calls. In the past, we did house calls. We saw it, we knew the family, we knew the kids. We saw what was going on and we identified, oh my God, there's mold all over that, that's a problem. Because we don't do this, we have lost such a significant part of causes of illnesses that we need to, to catch up on. Sorry, have you any work on the correlation between all of this and allergy and intolerances? Because that's a rising incident. Yeah, with mould, definitely, absolutely. With electromagnetic fields, the only thing I can read with, in terms of a uh, mast cells and macrophages and allergic, allergic responses with the skin reactions. Certainly people who have allergies and IgE mediated allergies are more susceptible to electromagnetic fields. Um, but a, a lot of the people that I deal with, they don't have allergies, but they seem to have all the symptoms of this. So when I go into a house, I have to rule out mould because it can cause very similar symptoms to EHS, which... Sorry, can we just revisit that LED? Are there any differences in LED lights? Just I've got an opportunity to put some different lights in my room at yes. work, and I want to know. Not that I'm aware of. No. No. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think it's time to wrap up and thank Nicole yeah. once again for coming.